to you by Chemistry. Hi everyone and welcome to Brought to You by Chemistry. What's brought to you by Chemistry, I hear you ask? Complicated reactions? Complicated exams? Even more complicated romances? You know, the ones that most people wouldn't understand, but it's okay because you have blind faith that it will work this time. I mean, yes, but in this case, Brought to you by Chemistry is a podcast series from the Royal Society of Chemistry, so you see the branding there. My name is Dr. Alex Lathbridge, and in this series we are back and better than ever because we're taking a look at batteries, bringing together experts from inside and outside the world of chemistry to help us understand the ins, the outs, the ups, the downs, the positives and the negatives of all things battery. Um, and I suppose the most difficult question is the one I'm going to start with, which is, could I please get you to introduce yourself? Well, good morning. I'm uh, Alan Whitehead. Uh, I'm the uh, Member of Parliament for Southampton, uh, and I'm also the Shadow uh, Energy Minister uh, and Green New Deal uh, Minister for Labour in the Shadow team. Uh, I spend my time in Parliament shadowing the real Energy Minister, and uh, engaging in uh, quite substantial and wide-ranging debate about all aspects of energy, uh, both in terms of our encounters, uh, but also uh, being responsible for responding for Labour on backbench debates and various things such as that. So that's largely my life in Parliament, but I'm very happy about that because I've also I've, I've been very interested in energy, particularly green energy, for many years and have spent a lot of time in Parliament advocating uh, for that uh, over the years uh, and therefore I'm I'm in a job I like doing. Now speaking of jobs that we like doing uh, can we please I mean I'm, I'm happy to be talking to you but um, you you made it sound like your job is quite you know oh, this is the day-to-day -day, whatever I told my little cousin that I'm going to be chatting to the shadow energy minister and uh, he said oh my god there's someone who works on shadow energy what is shadow energy <laughs> what is this? <laughs> So I'm guessing there's no such thing as shadow energy, but the first question I am going to ask you is what is up with energy here in the UK? I mean, how is the UK energy system changing? You know, it's 2022. There are there are changes afoot. Well, it, it is changing very rapidly now and it has changed very rapidly uh, over the last 10, 15 years. So, I mean, if we look back, uh, say, 20 years, the UK energy system was largely centralized. The vast majority of UK energy came from a relatively small number of sources, mainly gas-fired power stations, some nuclear power stations, uh, some coal. And you could run the whole system on the basis of inputs from those 80 or so uh, power stations and associated facilities. Wind uh, was in its infancy. Uh, and other forms of renewables were also very undeveloped. So you had uh, a system whereby, whereby all power was um, produced in the centre, uh, went down uh, the grid and eventually ended up in our homes and our offices and our, uh, and our factories. Now, all that has changed around completely now. So with the emergence of renewables, not just big renewables like offshore wind, but uh, you know, smaller household renewables, uh, such as solar, uh, and uh, you could say between those stands onshore wind. Then we've got probably a million plus inputs to the energy system. Uh, and the system is no longer centralized, uh, is no longer entirely dependent on those um, big power stations for its supply. And indeed, those big power stations are increasingly closing down because of the uh, need to reduce the, the, the carbon content of our energy systems by very radical amounts. So coal-fired power stations are going off line by 2025. Gas-fired power stations are uh, increasingly uh, beginning to close down or producing much lower levels of, of output. And the system is effectively becoming almost completely renewable. And indeed, that's a, a target that uh, is in everyone's minds now, because 
probably by 2035, we're going to have pretty much the complete energy system run uh, by renewable inputs. Okay, so it's becoming cleaner and you know, more decentralized. Now, with all of that, you know, you were talking about things like solar panels on people's roofs and stuff. Where do batteries fit into this? Because, you know, this is a podcast series about batteries. People want what they're here for. They know what they're here for. It's battery chat. Where do batteries come into this? Well, batteries are the one of the big solutions to the increasingly complex system that we're, we're faced with, with all these different inputs uh, to the system and all the different ways now um, that uh, uh, energy is coming into the system because uh, most but not all renewables are essentially variable. Uh, so that, uh, it is not exactly a great insight to say that um, offshore wind, for example, will blow really strongly on some days and uh, you won't get very much offshore wind on some other days. Same goes for solar uh, energy. Uh, what, we, what we get from wind and what we get from solar sometimes balance each other out because uh, sometimes it's sunny and not, uh, and not uh, windy and other days it's not sunny and is windy. So we think of the system as a whole you've got a whole lot of variable inputs going into the system, uh, both at, lo at local level and at national level. Those will produce quite a headache for those people who are balancing the system because, as I said previously, you knew what you were getting into the system. Uh, you could switch a power station on and it would produce a certain amount of power and that would be the end of it. Whereas now, uh, you have got in aggregate, a reasonably reliable source of power overall, but that will change substantially day to day, place to place, area to area. If you can produce a form of uh, energy storage, which can essentially gather that energy when it is, as it were, blowing so hard, the wind is blowing so hard that you've got to switch the power off from the energy in order to balance the system because there's so much coming on then maybe you can harvest that energy and bring it onto the system at a different time when you've got uh, a lower uh, input into the system uh, from that variable power. So the holy grail of the system, as it were, is can you gather the energy when there's a lot of it around, too much for the system, and hold it in reserve so that when there's less power that's needed for the system, you can introduce that back to the system and that balances all the peaks and troughs out and the system works uh, very well and very stably. And it, it, you can see that in our own households, uh, for example. Well, and a lot of people have got uh, solar panels on their roofs. Uh, we know that those solar panels will produce a lot of electricity when the sun's out, probably getting on for too much for the household to use. Um, but at other times, uh, they will produce a tiny fraction of what we're using. So. If you go and put a, a, a battery in your garage, um, which can actually take that solar output when it's uh, not needed by the house, and then you can use that battery in the household um, when the, the solar energy is not uh, providing you with power, you can produce pretty much most of your household energy needs overall by putting that battery into play alongside that solar power. So. The household solution is a microcosm of what we are going to have to do for the future as far as balancing our energy systems as a whole. And batteries are at the forefront of that. So like what you're talking about, that's really interesting, using the household as a microcosm for the entire, like the entire nation. But in terms of you know, people like myself having more power um, in how we get our power, <sighs> God, I just can't help myself. How, how can a government incentivize these sorts of changes? Because I had a leaflet um, in my door down, you know, I had a leaflet saying, oh, if you uh, put solar panels in, you know, we can potentially get X, Y, and Z sort of deal. I mean, is it this, is it this sort of method? Is that how it works? Well, it, it, it works in a, in, a, in a number of ways, um, which involve, uh, among other things, looking at, in some depth about how energy systems actually do work because as far as the should we say the renewable kitty is concerned that is the, uh, the wind 
farms, uh, the solar panels, the biomass uh, power stations, uh, all the, the range of uh, low carbon energy that uh, we're bringing forward. Uh, most of that has uh, been bought on the system by underwriting by the government uh, in terms of part of the of the cost of those systems uh, in the form of contracts for different renewable obligation, various other things, which uh, essentially makes that uh, power coming forward marketable um, because renewable systems have got an entirely different profile from those big old power stations that we've just been talking about, that they are capital intensive up front and the power that you get from them subsequently is virtually free. So what, what has happened is that that kit has come onto the system by that method. And now, once they're there, the power actually is very low cost. That impacts the system in interesting ways. Uh, during periods of um, relatively low uh, demand, that very cheap energy effectively pushes the remaining gas and coal inputs uh, off the system because it, they can't compete with that cheap power. Whereas in, in periods of very high uh, energy demand, those systems come back into place uh, in, in order to supply the, 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 the peaking uh, energy that we need. Uh, and they get quite well rewarded for that by the system. But you've fundamentally got two quite incompatible ways of producing energy running alongside each other. And then you're trying to integrate that in the system uh, as a whole. Now, batteries, therefore, don't need a subsidy to put them into place. What they do need is a system whereby they get rewarded for putting that additional energy into the system when it is needed. And that pays for the, the, the capital cost uh, of the battery over the period. I'm going to break it down as someone who's not, a, you know, I'm not the shadow energy minister. I may not understand all of it, but we have an entire system. We've got sort of a, a grid, a network, and the idea of phasing in these sorts of new greener models. So your solar, um, your hydroelectric, your sort of whatnot, um, and out phase, phasing out things like coal and, you know, other things that aren't necessarily um, good for us as we move forward. The idea is like very, very slowly, uh, you'd only need to bring in those you know, previous methods, your coal and what have you, uh, when times are tough. So when we don't have as much power available on the grid, um, but then the possibility is there that you can use more and more batteries and having those batteries means that we don't have to rely on sort of coal and other things so much. It's that when we have you know, when Britain does get our, our uh, one day of, of, of sun um, and our occasional windiness, we can store some of that green energy in the batteries and use it when times are tough. Does that make sense? Is that roughly it? Yeah, that is. That's, that, that's right. The, the existence of these older fossil forms of energy on the system is something that we also, we're going to have to remove in due course if we're to get to our net zero targets as far as climate change uh, is concerned uh, and we need to envisage uh, an energy system which doesn't have any of these sort of um, large fossil fuel uh, arrangements even as even as a backup uh, in the system in future so yes it is certainly true that uh, gas-fired power stations for example uh, will actually only exist in the future supply energy on the margins and may be held in strategic reserve for when times are, are, are really tough as far as the power supply is concerned. But in the end, even those won't be able to function. And by the way, of course, if they are, if they are sitting on the sidelines, just producing power for a few hours a year, then they're not economically viable to run uh, anymore. So not only will new gas-fired power stations not get built, uh, a number will close down uh, anyway, because of that particular circumstance. So we, we have to envisage an energy system which is using all the technology at its disposal to give us that firm, reliable energy system for the future. I always get this way because uh, 
Kieran always puts me up with really interesting guests. And I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating stuff. It's really in-depth and really fascinating. So, I mean, you've talked about all these processes that we're slowly bringing in or sort of want to bring in um, and are sort of thinking about and, and considering. I mean, what are the main challenges um, for sort of the UK government or really any government in bringing this in bringing in sort of a greener energy bringing in like you say batteries to store power when times are tough and reuse it I mean, what, what are the challenges that might slow down our progression to sort of net zero in 2035 well one of the one of the key challenges for the power system is electrification itself what we are looking at in terms of how our society overall runs is a very substantial change from, for example, where we get our heat for our homes from, how we power our vehicles, a substantial change from fossil fuels being the basis of those things we just take for granted on an everyday process. Uh, the idea that when we come home, our homes are going to be, uh, temperature is going to be 18 degrees C in our central heating and, uh, and so on. If we are going to, complete the decarbonisation of our system as a whole, that means that we very substantially got to electrify uh, the, or, or at least use non-fossil fuel gases uh, such as hydrogen and biogas for uh, heating our homes. And of course, we will have uh, a pretty much uh, universal uh, electric vehicles uh, by next decade and a half or so me as a human being and I, you know me as someone here in the uk i've seen my energy bills go up like massively and it's i mean it's scary and it's frustrating and it's annoying and i mean there are so many other adjectives i'm not going to use because this is a universal podcast for lots of people who may not might not want to hear watershed <laughs> that's the podcast people saying no you aren't allowed to swear alex so with this idea that we're moving towards, you know, more greener energy and less reliance on fossil fuels and sort of a volatile external market, how, how can we actually do this in, in record time? How can we actually move forward in such a way that people like me have our, you know, electricity prices reduced? How, how can this happen? How? <laughs> How, Alan? How? I mean, frankly, the uh, uh, quite a lot of the developments that um, are going to come forward in the next uh, very few years uh, will essentially have to be driven by government. Uh, we we can't simply uh, say uh, we hope there is there going to be a uh, a, a big um, array of, of of new energy sources. And somehow the market will sort this all out and um, uh, we can wait while the market does sort itself out and these things come on stream. We've got to have uh, a program essentially where the government is investing in these new energy sources and that will come back on, uh, I have to say, on general taxation. Uh, but I think that the, the, the point that uh, we need to keep hold of is that once those new energy sources are in place, energy supply essentially will be far cheaper than is the case at the present. And so, yes, there's an investment cycle that will have to be undertaken, but energy itself will not be that expensive. And not only will it not be that expensive, it will be green. And uh, that is a, uh, a key objective uh, that we've got to keep in mind. So getting the, the system as a whole balanced between getting enough new supply into the system, getting that system to use that new supply in a very mean way and distributing across the hours of the day so that you get the maximum power at all time, which is where batteries come back in again. Uh, and uh, then uh, I'm a further, I'm afraid, a bit of complexity, but um, making sure that we can price the system properly against renewables uh, will actually give us, in the end, a pretty 
affordable energy system. A few bumps in the road uh, as we go along, but hey, I mean, I've, I've, I've just looked at my new energy bill um, with the fact that gas is coming into the system at international prices and is, is hiking people's energy bills up, uh, I think by uh, 600 pounds, six, 700 pounds uh, come this April from the previous level and probably a further seven, 800 pounds uh, or so in the autumn. We can't say at the moment energy is remotely cheap or affordable. So getting our system uh, into a position where energy is affordable because we've completely turned it round from its present arrangements is a pretty good goal to, 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 to seek for, I think. Yeah, I mean, it is. these are good goals to sort of achieve. I feel as I'm going full Paxman right now, and I'm not trying to. <laughs> Alan, you're in the hot seat. No, but I think these are these are good goals to try and achieve. But like one thing I was thinking, even while you were speaking there, is like, I want to live in a world where, you know, I, I want to live in a world where I can buy like an electric car. And so I don't have to continually be, you know, pumping diesel um, into my 2008 Nissan Micra. But because of like energy bills and how things are, I don't have enough money to buy an electric vehicle. So there are all of these, like you say, sort of these balances going forward and it becomes really tricky and like really, really tough. Um, and so like going forward, looking forward, like we've sort of said, this idea of a sustainable future, how, how do you see Britain in 2040, 2050? What are your hopes and dreams, Alan? Tell me, tell me all your hopes and dreams. Well, my hopes and dreams are that we will have most of our transport fleet either uh, electrically run uh, or uh, perhaps in the case of uh, transport uh, logistics, that's you know, trucks and, and, and large vehicles, uh, hydrogen fuel cell arrangements for those trucks. So the net benefit of that is firstly going to be that the price of, of fuel for those vehicles is then in direct relation to the price of energy generally and it's not subject to international energy uh, prices such as ga gas and, um, and, and petroleum. And of course, it's, it's not only green in terms of carbon emissions, actually it's pretty good for the air quality and so on we have at the moment. So a, a clean transport system and home energy systems, which are run on an equally clean basis, uh, because we are smart enough to balance the whole thing properly, a reliable energy system that uh, runs pretty much solely on renewable sources. Uh, as we know, electric vehicles uh, are now, in terms of their life cycles, approaching the same sort of cost fossil fuel vehicles will have. Of course, as they get more and more into the system, secondhand vehicles. Uh, become available, then the cost of actually owning and running an electric vehicle uh, is not going to be very high. If we put that principle across the rest of the system, as we, we've seen, for example, from the, the extent to which the cost of offshore wind um, has come down uh, very radically over the last 15, 20 years from those what look like impossibly expensive systems that were first set up now to systems that actually produce the cheapest uh, electricity uh, around, then just the fact that those are in mass production, that they are in the system, that the system is working well with them, uh, will reduce costs uh, as well for the future. So I see a pretty, a pretty good future for low carbon energy, that it will be reliable, it will be green, it will be clean, and it will allow us to live our lives pretty much as we live at the moment, um, only on that low carbon basis. And that, I think, unfortunately, that will, that will be a vision which will come to pass, which I will have to observe from a rocking chair somewhere in, the, uh, in, in my retirement home. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a vision that's with us now. It's not, it's not something that's in the minds of a few uh, seers. All the elements are there now. We don't need any new technology to do this. We've just actually got to get on with it and make sure the system works. So, I mean, you, what you didn't mention there was that you, in your retirement home, in your rocking chair, that rocking chair will be connected up, up to a battery, which will be powering, powering the grid. So with every movement 
of yourself going back and forth, you will be charging up that battery and you will be able to sell that back to the grid. Okay. Well, well that's, that's, yeah. My, my, yeah. my electric rocking chair sounds like a pretty good possibility. There you go. That's it. That is it. In the future, uh, sort of old people's homes, they will be self sufficient. All right. No public funding at all. That's how it's going to work. Well, they, that is they, the... certainly, they certainly should have solar panels across the whole of their roofs. There you go. They, 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 they should have batteries associated with those solar panels. So that the, uh, as it were, the retirement home becomes a self-generating uh, centre, um, and I mean, if we've got ground source heat pumps associated with that as well, um, then you've got a, a, a pretty good prospect of a of a, 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 a of a warm, cosy retirement home that's making some money as well. That retirement, whichever retirement home that perhaps you end up in, is going to be so annoyed at you. It's like, oh God, we failed. <laughs> all right, we had a yearly meeting and he's just, Alan is not happy. He's like, well, don't, don't give him any pudding. Then that's all we just don't give him any, but that's what he gets for trying to give us a, a, an audit. With that, we always like to do one final question, which is if you could have our listeners take one thing away from this conversation, what would you want it to be? My takeaway is green energy is going to save us all and it is not going to be a burden on us. And the quicker we get there and the, the smarter we manage our way forward uh, using all the techniques at our, at our disposal, including batteries and various other things, then the better off we'll be for the future. And so there is no time to lose now. We've just got to do it. Wonderful. I mean, that was brilliant. That was a wonderful ending. That's like, I think, in the top three we've had. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jacqueline Edge um, and I work at Imperial College uh, looking at batteries. I'm a physicist by training. As someone who knows, I'd say, a few things at least about batteries, maybe you can answer this question. What important role do you think that batteries might play in energy storage? Like, we, I of course know that batteries store things, like that's their, that's the basics, all right? Everyone knows batteries store energy, otherwise why are we here? But What's the super cool, like the super cool role they'll play in like the future now? Like, tell me about them. Tell me about batteries. So batteries are a very useful technology. Um, they've been around for quite a while. They, they were first discovered in the 70s. Um, and one of the things that makes them special about all, from all the energy storage technologies is that they respond very quickly and they're very highly efficient. Um, they store the energy, they take electrical energy and they store it as um, part electrical, part chemical, um, and then they release it again as electricity. Um, and because they respond very quickly, that means that they are very good for many grid services that require sort of millisecond response. Okay, and you said something really interesting there. What do you mean by they respond really quickly? Because I've never heard that when it comes to batteries. I've never had a battery talk to me. So I mean, what, what does it mean when you say they respond really quickly? So if you if you need to start charging the battery, it's, it's a millisecond before it starts charging. And if you need to get the energy back out, it's milliseconds before the energy comes back out as well. Are there other storage things that, that, that do it worse? Yes, there are other energy storage technologies which are slower. So for example, um, pumped hydro is, is not milliseconds, it's more like uh, minutes before you might start running the turbines and get the water, um, powering the turbines to make the electricity. Um, and compressed air is another example where um, it can take perhaps a few minutes for the, for the system to effectively boot up. I mean, we're not going to talk about this. This is, this is, this is battery land. But I didn't realise you can use compressed air with energy storage. That's really cool. I yeah, mean, there are many different types of energy storage technologies. Batteries are only one. They just I happen mean, to be the current winner. Batteries are the most important ones, all right? This is battery town. We don't talk about any other energy storage <laughs> devices. Now, we've bigged up batteries. Yeah, but are there any like negatives to batteries? Ah, you see that? Positive, negative, battery jokes. That's what we're here for. But seriously, <laughs> are there any... Thank you. But are there any real downsides to batteries? Yes. Um, from my point of view, um, so the reason we're doing batteries is to try and introduce more renewables into the system. Um, and so generally, they're a good thing because they're helping us to displace fossil fuels, which means less carbon. Um, but from my point of view, 
the focus has mainly been on carbon footprint, and there are other environmental impacts that we need to consider as well. So the biggest problem that we're facing is where do we get the minerals that we make the batteries from? Um, and so most of those are in deposits, which we have to dig up the earth to, to retrieve. Um, and often those deposits tend to be in areas of high biodiversity. So that means more habitat destruction and less biodiversity. And so that to me is a big problem. You know, we're, we're focusing on a carbon footprint, um, but we need to focus on, on the habitat destruction as well. So in terms of batteries, I mean, you talked about, um, you know, all these um, mineral deposits and whatnot. I mean, are there a huge variety of different materials, you know, elements, minerals that go into batteries, the most common batteries that we, we see? I mean, you don't have to go into it super in depth because we have other episodes looking at it, but I'm just interested <laughs> from your perspective. Um, yes. So batteries are by nature quite complicated structures. Um, and so they already need quite a lot of different um, high value minerals in order to work properly. Um, but the other complication is that there's a huge range of different battery chemistries. Um, and so if we're talking about the whole portfolio of batteries that need to be constructed, um, there's a, that means a very big range of different types of materials. You know, we're talking about all the different requirements that batteries have in terms of like materials and, and whatnot. I mean, so how do you how do you do things like life cycle assessments? I've been told life cycle assessments are a big thing when it comes to batteries. So how how do you make sure that the life cycle of a battery is like good? Um, so you have to break it down first and look across the entire battery life cycle and consider what all the different stages are. So it's generally considered that there's materials extraction. So that's raw materials extraction, mining of the minerals, etc. Um, and then there's a certain amount of refinement. So there's certain uh, chemical processes that you put those materials through to get them up to battery grade materials. And then there's all the processes in which you construct the battery itself. So all the manufacturing processes. And then there's installation of the battery into electric vehicles or stationary storage devices. Then there's using the battery. So that's, um, you know, using it for 10 to 15 years in an electric vehicle. Um, there may be second life applications, so sometimes electric vehicle battery can be retired to be used in stationary storage. Um, and then eventually we want to then recover the batteries um, and recycle those materials. Ideally, that, that would be the best way to have a circular economy um, and to prevent a mountain of batteries building up at the end. So then you break it down to all those stages and you consider how do we account for all the impacts that happen at each stage. So every material and every process needs to be uh, looked at in terms of how much energy does it use? How much water does it use? How much of each material does it use? How much waste is there? Is some of the material you know, ends up in scrap? Um, and so you've got to factor all those things in, including uh -huh. other gaseous emissions. And once you tot all that up, you can then have a look across the whole life cycle and say, well, this is better than some previous technology, for example. Okay. And so very briefly, could you explain, like, just in general terms, like, what is a life cycle assessment? I must admit, the literature is a little bit um, inconsistent in this. But generally, what it means is that you, you do all this sort of accountancy of all the inputs and outputs of every step and every process. Um, and then you could then measure, for example, carbon footprint is a very common measurement. You tot up the entire carbon footprint um, across the whole life cycle, including crediting batteries because they obviously save um, carbon emissions by replacing a fossil fuel car. Um, and then that would give you a net carbon footprint, which you can then compare with, with life cycle assessments of other technologies. Um, but the life cycle assessment studies are a little bit inconsistent because they don't always start from the very beginning and they don't always include recycling. So a full life cycle assessment should really consider everything from the very start where you extract the materials right to the point where you recycle it and put it back into making new batteries. And so that would be a complete cradle to cradle life cycle assessment. So it's not just about looking at the entire like again, the entire lifespan of a battery. It's about breaking down each stage, like the extraction, the minerals, the manufacturing, the use, like the pros and cons, the benefits and the um, the opposite of the benefits, disadvantages of each stage, and then sort of doing an assessment on that. Yes, 
That's correct. Okay, okay. I mean, that's a lot of work. I mean, when I think <laughs> of a double A battery, I don't realize that all this this effort and time has gone into it. Yeah, um, exactly. And and what that would then tell you. So, for example, you could then say, well, the carbon footprint or the air miles or whichever metric you're using um, comes with that product. And the idea is then you could say, well, this battery is so many air miles as opposed to this other one. Um, and so then the consumer can make a choice about which one they prefer. But like, how do you think that governments around the world, or at least the, the UK government, can make batteries better in terms of like our infrastructure when it comes to like getting rid of batteries or recycling batteries? Because I know like if I have some batteries now, I can take it to like Tesco and there'll be like a a little um, like box or a little like thing you can put your, like a little uh, see-through bin that you can put your batteries in there. But I imagine that there's actually a more formal way of doing it. Um, how how can that process be made better? Um, so there are uh, regulations which are sort of helping to guide industry into how to, um, the fact that they have to recycle their batteries. And so that means that they should start thinking when they design the battery and put it together, how, how might it be recycled in an economic way? Um, so the UK government... Um, needs to strengthen those regulations and make sure that, that they are um, that they will achieve the desired result and that is that we do recover the batteries we do take them apart and we do recover as many of the materials as possible um, but there's also an element of improving the design to make them easier to take apart at the moment they're very difficult to take apart so you have many sort of fastening methods and weldings um, but if we had a different design where you could basically just unplug the modules and the batteries uh, then that would be much more economical to recycle so modularly designed batteries you think that that would be a, like a cool future absolutely it also means you could then plug out cells that aren't working um, and put a new one so then that saves the whole pack okay so if you have like an elect if like say it was a big battery like an electric vehicle battery you could open up that um electric vehicles battery and just replace the small bits in there that the ones that aren't great like when you have a remote control uh, and the battery's gone you don't throw all the batteries in case it's just one that has messed up exactly wow the electric cars are sort of like my television remote this is great i love batteries so for listeners if you had one key takeaway for this entire episode what would you say is what would you want people to take away from this um, so we should never forget that batteries are very important um, and that we do need them to, to help us decarbonize not only our transport systems, but also our energy grids. Um, but at the same time, we just need to be very cautious um, that we're not, that we're using the right materials that we're using, um, that we can, that we're trying to mitigate as many of the other environmental impacts as possible. Um, and I think mining needs a, a complete overhaul. They need to make the, their process much more sustainable and less destructive on, on habitat. Um, but we need to take into account all the factors. And I think um, we need that strategic analysis before we start really making mass amounts of batteries. Okay. So, I mean, I said that was my last question, but are you optimistic for the future? I am actually, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm encouraged by how much energy is going into the decarbonization process. It may not be enough, it's possible, but um, at least people seem enthusiastic and they are trying. Yeah. And so in 20 years time, like, where do you think we'll be with batteries? I mean, I ask people this all the time. They're like, well, I won't be around to find out. And I'm like, well, okay, let me make it shorter. 20 years. Where do you think we'll be? <laughs> Well, um, I, I'm encouraged that, that I think we will have a good recycling process and that batteries will not end up in, in massive mountains and landfills. Um, and so I think if we, if we get it right in 20 years time, batteries can really have helped us to, to resolve climate change without creating new problems along the way. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I like, I feel really optimistic now. Um, and so, I mean, thank you so much, of course. That's all for this episode of Brought to You by Chemistry. Join us next time where we'll be exploring the impact of mining and whether or not ethical batteries can ever exist. It was produced by Hiran Joshi and Elizabeth Ratcliffe and presented by me, Alex Lathbridge. <laughs>